but I'm going to be doing a four-session teaching on Abraham called The Footsteps of Faith. Abraham, who was the father of all who believe, and those who walk in the footsteps of the faith of our father Abraham. We're going to look at what that means and discover how we can have those to, to develop our faith the way Abraham did. Following in the footsteps of the faith of our, our father Abraham speaks of an ongoing journey of faith, speaks of a progressive unfolding of a life of faith. Brennan Manning said it this way, we're not travel agents who hand out brochures to places we've never been. We are faith explorers on a journey of faith. Faith explorers on a journey of faith. Abraham's life exemplifies the life of faith, and the life of faith is a journey. Abraham was a great man of faith, but not in the beginning. He didn't start off a great man of faith. Earlier in the book of Genesis, there are, excuse me, there are Men like Noah, Abel, and Enoch, who stood out as beacons of light in a dark world, as shining testimonies of righteousness against the stark unrighteousness all around them. But that's not true of Abraham. Abraham was an idolater who lived in, right in the heart of a culture and a society that had given itself over to pagan idolatry. He came from Ur of the Chaldees, which is in Bab Babylon, and not far from where God brought judgment on the Tower of Babel a few generations earlier. earlier. Abraham was very much a product of his society He didn't stand out like a beacon of light in his generation. He blended in with everyone else and did the same things they did. But he was an ordinary person who allowed God to, to lead him. He followed God, and God was able to teach him how to walk by faith. The call of Abraham was, is the beginning of God's plan for redemption for a fallen world. A plan that would find its ultimate fulfillment, fulfillment excuse me, in the coming of Christ. So our study in the life of Abraham is going to help us understand the purpose and plan of God in redemption and also how to follow God as a faith explorer on a journey of faith. Let's, let's read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 10. It's in your notes. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 through 10. It says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went. Obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. It's kind of a strange <clears throat> statement to make. He obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. So where did he go? He went somewhere, <clears throat> but he didn't know where he was going. But he did it in faith. I know a lot of people don't know where they're going, and it's not necessarily faith. But Abraham, when called, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, <clears throat> which meant he had no 
permanent dwelling in, in the, the Promised Land. He constantly moved around, lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder was God. Let me just point out a few uh, lessons of faith that we find in the life of Abraham. First of all, faith is an act of obedience to the call of God. It's an act of obedience to the call of God. Many times we think faith is, is just, um, just passive and I don't do anything and if God wants me to do something, he'll make me do it or whatever. But we need to realize that Faith is an active verb, not a passive noun. It's an active verb, not a passive noun. Faith does something. I like what uh, Bob Goff, a Christian author, says. He says the Christian life is very simple. Love God, love your neighbor, and do something. Do something. Because faith is an active verb, not a passive noun. Faith takes action. Faith does something. And when, when, when faith does something, that's called obedience. Obedience is faith in action. Obe obedience is actually a word in both the Old Testament and New Testament, which means to hear, to incline your ear, to listen. Um, in the Greek, to hear amiss is to, dis to disobey, means to hear amiss. You didn't hear right, you didn't act on what you heard. So obedience means to listen with an expectation and a willingness to respond. <clears throat> faith is an act of obedience to the call of God. By faith, Abram, when called, obeyed and went. Faith is, number two, a step-by-step -step daily dependence upon God. It's a step-by-step -step daily dependence upon God. By faith, Abram went, obeyed, even though he didn't know where he was going. Have you, have you ever felt like that? <clears throat> like you were going, but you didn't know where you were going? And you ever felt like you came to the end of your map? And your GPS isn't working. You, uh, there's no internet access. And you, there's not even any gas stations around where you can ask for directions. You're just going, not knowing where you go. You have no idea where you're going. If so, welcome to the journey of faith. The essence of faith is following God even when you don't know where you, you're going. Have you, have you ever... We have realized many times God leads us in ways we don't understand, the places we don't want to go. But we go, we follow God, and we, we want a map. We want, we want to see, see it on a map. We want to know where we're going, what to expect, when we're going to get there. But faith doesn't even begin until we reach the end of our map. Then we go into a realm of the unknown where we have to, by faith, trust God. As long as you have a map, you don't need faith. As long as you have an itinerary, God tells you, this is what you're going to do every day for the rest of your life, then that doesn't, you have to follow God. So Abraham discovered that following God was a step-by-step -step daily dependence on God. even though he had no idea where he was going. The greater our obedience to the call of God for our, for our life, the greater the revelation of God's promise and appropriation of God's provision. The greater our obedience to the call of God in our life, the greater he releases his provision and his purpose 
and promise in our life. Even Jesus, in John chapter 5 and chapter 8, said, I do nothing of my own initiative. I do what I see the Father doing. That's what I do. When I hear the Father saying those words that I speak to others. So it's a step-by-step daily dependence upon God. Thirdly, we find in this passage that God rarely gives reasons, but he always gives promises. He rarely gives reasons, but he always gives promises. God says, I want you to leave your country, your family, your relatives, your friends. I want you to give up everything that would give you a sense of security. I want you to relocate your family and move to a foreign country that you know nothing about. But if you will go, then I have some promises with, for you as well. I, I will promise to give you a great name, to give you, make you a great nation, and to give you great blessing so you will be a blessing to others. I would, I would say to him, probably would have said to God, can I just take the blessing and stay where I am? But God says, if you go, then uh, I'll, I've got some promises for you, some blessings for you as well. In the beginning, God's promise was, was very vague. It was just go forth from your country, your father's household, your, your relatives, and I will show you a land. So it was simply very general, it was very vague. He didn't promise it to him even. He said, I'm going to show you a land. And then as he went forward in, in the purpose of God, the purpose of God unfolded for him. My favorite quote about faith has become Martin Luther's description of, grace, of faith. He says, faith is a free surrender and a joyous wager. A free surrender. A free surrender means I freely surrender my life to God and a joyous wager, which is, means a joyful bet. A wager is a he bet. He said, I'm betting everything on God. Joyfully. And what am I betting on? I'm betting on the unseen, unknown, untested goodness of God. God rarely gives reasons, so it doesn't help much to ask why. He just requires that we act on an act of faith in his in his word and he always gives promises. And right, number four, faith holds tightly the things of God and lightly the things of the world. Faith holds tightly to the things of God and lightly to the things of this world. By faith he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents. He was looking forward to the city that had foundations whose architect and builder is God. Abraham typ typifies the believer whose citizenship is in heaven, but who is traveling through this world, through this earth, as an alien and a stranger. Abraham didn't fit in. He knew he didn't fit in. The people in Canaan knew he didn't fit in. As long as you're following God in the life of faith, you might as well realize that you won't fit in. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. So don't become too attached to this world and things of this world because we're just passing through. Faith holds tightly to the things of God and lightly to the things of this world. There are two things said of Abraham. He built an altar and he pitched his tent, lived in tents. Tents and altars are two words that describe the journey of faith for Abraham. He 
He never built a house. He never bought property. He never settled down in the land of Canaan. He just passed through the land. The only property he did buy was a cemetery plot for his wife and himself. Because then his, he could leave the, his bodies behind in this life. But he, you find in the stages as he went on, he pitched a tent and moved his tent from, from place to place. And he built an altar whenever he went to a new place. Altar speaks of devotion to God. And the tent speaks of no, no, no permanent dwelling. So don't get too attached to things of this world because we're ultimately we're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God that has eternal foundations. A cav cavalry troop was uh, camping for the night and one of the young soldiers that was pounding his, his stake in for the setting up the tents and he kept pounding it, kept pounding it. And the captain came over and said, son, what are you doing? So I'm driving the stakes in. So we don't drive them in too deep because we're going to be pull, we're going to be moving out in the morning. That's kind of a, a picture, a parable of our life. Don't drive your stakes in too deep in the ground because we're pulling out in the morning. We're going to move. We're just passing through here. Tightly hold the things of God. Lightly hold the things of the world. He was, he was looking for a city with foundations whose architect and builder was God. Psalm 24 says, he, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it, the, the earth, on the seas and established it upon the waters. The world is founded on the seas. There's nothing more unstable, nothing more unsteady or constantly changing than the seas. It's not the best foundation for something he said, but the world is so is constantly changing, it's unsteady, it's unstable. Don't build your life on it because it's, it's founded on the waters. Abraham was looking for a city, it was built on a lasting eternal foundation whose architect was God himself. So in thir Hebrews 13, 14, it says, for here we do not have any, an enduring city, but we are looking for a city, who's, a city that is to come. Faith is realizing that this is not our, our final home. We are aliens in a foreign land looking for a city that has eternal foundations. So faith is, is an active obedience to God's call. Faith is a step-by-step, -step daily dependence upon God. Faith, God rarely gives reasons. He always gives promises. And faith is holding tightly the things of God and lightly the things of the world. Hebrews 11 that we just read is kind of the airbrushed version of Abraham's life. You would assume from this passage in Hebrews 11 that Abraham obeyed perfectly, that he never, he never missed a beat. He perfectly obeyed God, instantly obeyed God. So, But the fact is, then we're going to look in the account in chapter 11 of, or chapter 12 of Genesis, and we begin to see his flaws, his blemishes, his warts, and Abraham did not follow God perfectly. There's a mixture of obedience and disobedience, faith and unbelief. That's why I put as a subtitle, Abraham's call, delays, t detours, missteps, and mistakes. In the end, however, Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham was a friend of God, not because he was perfect and holy and righteous, but because he was willing to be led by God. 
and they followed him in faith. So, friends are simply two people who are on a journey together. God invites us to be, to his, to be friends with him, to join his journey, a journey of faith. The call of Abraham is a picture of a believer's salvation. God's call to come out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So let's, let's look in Genesis chapter 11, verse 31 to 12, chapter 12, verse 8. Genesis 11.31, Terah, who was Abram's father, took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram. And together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Now God called him to leave his country, to leave his father's house, to leave his his relatives, and to go to Canaan. If you know the geography, there's what's called the Fertile Crescent, which is the Tigris River, travels up from Babylon, so it travels up and then reaches the peak and it comes down to uh, Canaan and down into Egypt. So you got this Fertile Crescent Fertile Crescent, and at the top of it is Haran. And they were heading from Ur of the Chaldees. They got halfway to Canaan, and they stopped in Haran. So they and settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless you and bless, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran, took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan and arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem, At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I will give you this land. So he built an altar there for the Lord who appeared to him. We can stop there. He says... God says, I want you to leave your country. They left the country, got halfway to Canaan. Then they stopped for five years. So for five years, there was nothing mentioned of anything he did in Haran because it was not, it was just a, a delay in the purposes of God, which is what the name Terah means. It means, means uh, delay. He gets to Haran, and then when his father dies, he continues to do what he set out to do originally, and that is to go to Canaan. He goes to Canaan. When he gets into Canaan, then God expands his promise. As he completes his obedience, God's, God's commandment, God's, his promise is, becomes greater it was originally just a land he would show him. Now it's the land that he's going to give to his offspring. To his offspring, I will give this land. Abraham's call is a threefold call of separation. And God's call in our life is ultimately to call, 
call of separation from separation from the world, separation from uh, the, our, our people and our father's household. Let me just, in your notes, it's there, Abraham's call. It's a call to separation from, to leave your country. That is to enter a new kingdom, the kingdom of God. Secondly, it's to leave your people, which is, means to embrace the new identity, become identified with the people of God, and to leave your father's household, which means to come under a new authority, the lordship of Jesus Christ. Just as God's call to Abraham was threefold, so God's promises are threefold. I will make you into a great nation, I will give you a great name, and I will make you a great blessing to all the peoples of the world. God's call to Abraham was not just a call to come out, it was a call to go in. How many of you know God doesn't just call you out, he always calls you into his purpose, into something else. The call of God is to, the call to leave behind the old and to come into something new. Many times we leave a life of sin, we, we give our life to Christ, we leave the things we, we were doing, but we never come into the full provision, power, and purpose of God. Deuteronomy 6.23 says, He brought us out from there in order to bring us in. He brought us out from Egypt in order to bring us in, not so that we would die in the wilderness, but he wants to bring us into his purpose and his power. Now this, this is the last lesson I want to leave with you, and this is the most important, to understand that's this, religion can, can bring you out, but it cannot bring you in. Religion can bring you out, take you out of the, where you were, but it cannot bring you in. Let me, let me elaborate on that. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 31, who received the revelation from God? Um, verse 1 of chapter 12 tells us, the Lord said to Abram, to do these things and go to the land I will show you. So who was it who received the revelation? It was Abram. But who was it who took them out of Ur of the Chaldees to head toward, the, toward Canaan? That was in verse 31 of chapter 11. It was Terah who brought them out. Abraham, Abraham, we're starting to see some of the warts now. Abraham's response was not immediate and perfect obedience. In fact, he seemed reluctant to leave Ur. His father had to pull him along and, and urge him to, to obey God. How far did Terah get? He set out to go to Canaan, but he only got halfway there. Terah speaks of Religion without revelation or religion without relationship. Terah was very religious, but he had, no, he had not received a revelation from God. So Terah could bring him out, but he could not bring him into Canaan. Religion can take you out of the world, the world system, but we get stuck halfway many times. And Haran means parched, parched. So religion very often brings you to a dry, arid place, halfway between the pleasures of the world and the fullness of God's provision. You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't gamble, you define, define your religion by what you don't do, but you have, you have no power, you have no provision um, of God, so you're in this arid place, this parched 
area, parched place, where you're not experiencing the fullness of God. The Bible says that they, there are people who have the form of God in this, but they don't have the power. They deny the power of it. It wasn't until Terah died that Abraham got back on track and continued his journey in God. So let me wrap it up this way. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, we're told that the gospel message was, was taught originally, preached originally to Abraham. And the gospel message was that they would, it's an invitation to be part of God's people. It's an invitation to leave the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of darkness, and to be translated into the kingdom of light, to be recipients of his blessing, and to be partners with him in his purpose in the earth. It's both an expression of grace and a response of obedience. The call of God contains obedience to, the call, to God's call and promise. Our response is to obey, but God says six times, I will. We're called to obey him, but God says, I will. I will bless you. I will let me find the exact passage. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you, and so on. He says, we're called to obey, but God says, I will. I am the one who will accomplish this in your life. As he increasingly separated himself from the country of Ur of the Chaldees and his relatives and his father's house, God's promise of blessing increased and God's call became clearer. Is there, God's call on our life is a call to in obedience follow him and go out. And we're called to, sep to a life of separation. That's what the word holiness means or sanctification. The word means to be separated out from and separated to. Um, separate out from the world and dedicated to God. Is there anything that is holding you back from this moving on in God and moving on in faith and embracing the fullness of his purpose for your life? Are we stuck in, some of us may be stuck in Haran. Some of us have maybe given our life to Christ, but we haven't come into the fullness of what God wants to bring us into. So we're, we're stuck in a parched place, stuck in religion that um, has the form of God in us but doesn't have the power, doesn't have the provision, doesn't have all that God wants to give us. Then God will, God will invite you to come all the way in, invite you to experience his life and his power as well. How many would like that to have God do that for you, bring you to a greater depth? Okay, amen. Let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, many times like Tara and like Abraham, we get stuck in our walk with God. We fail to experience the fullness of all that you've called us to, to because we 
we don't move forward in your purpose because we've gotten stuck somewhere. So I pray that you would bring us into a greater measure of the fullness of your provision, your power, the life of God, so we can walk in the footsteps of the faith of our father, Abraham. Pray that as we go through this, his life, as we look at the life of Abraham, we will discover the faith that he wants us to experience. So I pray that you would do this for us and that we would give glory and praise in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for that incredible message and a reminder. I believe that was a word from the Lord. There's a, there's a little song, a little hymn that we used to do at a church that uh, I used to belong to. And um, it's a little, little peppy tune. I'm not sure if the band knows it, but I'm going to teach you the lyrics to it. It simply says, God did not bring us out this far to take us back again. He brought us out to take us into the promised land. God did not bring us out this far to take us back again. That's right. He brought us out to take us into the promised land. And the next part. Though there be giants in the land, I will not be afraid. He brought us out to take us into the promised land. Though there be giants. Though there be giants in the land, I will not be afraid. He brought us out to take us into the promised land. God did not bring us. God did not bring us out this far to take us back again. He brought us out to take us into the promised land. God did not bring us out this far to take us back again. He brought us out to take us into the promised land. Though there be giants, though there be giants, 